Howdy folks, it's your buddy, Old Saw, here with another frightening tale for you. This one might make you think twice about your leisurely pastimes. So grab your fishing gear and hop in the boat, and we'll get down to the grisly details. Gone Fishing by Steve L. Clark Performed by Don Tackett Jim McKinney cast out his line. The lure made a soft plunk as it hit the surface and disappeared into the water. The sun broke through the tree line to the east, covering the lake in brilliant shades of scarlet and gold. A soft breeze swept across the water, wrapping Jim in the cool touch of a June morning. It would have been perfect if not for the smell. Despite his best efforts, he could not escape the stench of rot. The dead people standing along the bank were multiplying constantly. In some places, they were shoulder to shoulder. He couldn't see the north bank, but he suspected he would find the same if he bothered to fire up the troll motor and investigate. He was surrounded, so no matter which way the wind blew, he was bombarded by the smell of decaying flesh. Three days prior, it hadn't been so bad. A few of the dead were loitering around the ramp as he backed the trailer into the water. He smashed one in the head with a crowbar when it ventured too close while he worked to release the boat. He preloaded it with all the supplies he would need and left the truck parked on the ramp. The first night was peaceful, disturbed only by the occasional groan from one of the creatures. By the second night, the bank was alive with a constant movement as more and more of them reached the edge. On the third night, there was no question. He wasn't getting out of the water alive. Fucking zombies. At first, the news coverage referred to them as infected and the first reports of violence were labeled as random acts by people under the influence of some contaminated strain of street drug. In less than a day, the word zombie was trending on social media. It was as good a word as any, and the parallels between what actually happened and the plot of a hundred horror movies were eerily similar. Within days, the cities became war zones, and no area of the country was unscathed. News reports became frantic outbursts with vague instructions to reach safety until there were no safe places to go. The world burned to the ground and it only took three weeks. Jim reeled in his line, checked the lure, and cast it out again. Plunk. As he cranked the rod, he thought about Cheryl and the boys. Garrett was a truck driver. He was hauling a trailer out west when it started. Peyton was a high school teacher in Cincinnati. He hoped they were okay. In his heart, he knew they were not. It was one thing to suspect that his sons were gone, victims of this damn nightmare the world had turned into. It was another thing altogether to know that Cheryl was gone. He saw her life taken by one of those monsters, then he'd taken care of the undead version of her himself. For a time, their home in rural Ohio had proven to be a haven. They were miles from the nearest town, most of those quite small, and only a few neighbors to speak of. The house was stocked with supplies, and Jim had a respectable arsenal stashed away. While civilization collapsed on television, their world remained mostly unchanged. Jim was retired and Cheryl worked from home, so it wasn't a stretch for them to stay put in the house. 
The biggest adjustment was Jim couldn't jump in the truck and take the boat to the lake whenever he felt like it, which he felt like doing a lot. Everything crashed to a halt that last morning when Cheryl went out to fetch the eggs. Jim sat on the front porch, sipping a cup of coffee and scanning the countryside for any of the creatures. He had only seen a handful of them since the outbreak began, and even then, only from a distance. Looking back, the lack of zombies roaming the countryside lulled him into a false sense of security. He should have known better. When Cheryl screamed, he knew exactly what had happened. He jumped out of the glider on the porch, his coffee mug shattering on the wooden floor, and raced around the side of the house. Cheryl lay on the ground beside the chicken coop. A zombie was perched atop her, bent forward, tearing chunks of flesh from her throat. An involuntary choking sound escaped him. Her still body left no doubt. She was dead. The zombie, having heard Jim's choking sob, turned slowly toward him. Meat hung from the creature's mouth, and the fresh spray of blood from Cheryl's lacerated neck contrasted the pale hue of the creature's skin. Slowly, it climbed to its feet and stumbled in Jim's direction. Jim roared as he sprinted at the zombie and tackled it. His eyes fell on a cinder block sitting on the ground next to the coop, and Jim yanked it up with one hand, pinning the monster down with the other. He raised the stone block above his head and drove it into the creature's face. The impact killed it instantly, shattering the skull and destroying the brain. But Jim continued to slam the block again and again until nothing remained but a pulpy ruin. He rolled off the creature and lay on the grass. The sky was clear and the bright blue you only get in summer. The normalcy mocked him. He lay there for a few moments, waiting for some reaction to come. He wanted to scream or cry. Instead, he was numb. He might have stayed there in the grass forever, but Cheryl moved beside him. Her leg twitched in his peripheral and he lurched into a sitting position. Hope flickered, but he knew better. He had seen enough news reports to know what happened to people who were bitten. He got to his feet, not daring to look at Cheryl, for fear that seeing her open eyes would break him, and walked to the house. He pulled open the back screen door, stepped inside the kitchen, and grabbed the shotgun he left sitting there in case of an emergency in case one of those things got too close to the house. Cheryl was one of those things now. A half-full bottle of whiskey sat on the counter, and he snatched it up, took a long pull, then stepped back outside. Cheryl was on her feet and stumbling toward him. Before he could change his mind, he leveled the shotgun at her. I'm sorry, Cheryl. The chickens erupted into a frenzy as the shotgun blast echoed. Sometimes, even now, out on the lake, the sound of the shotgun goes off in his head, reminding him of what he did. He reeled his line back in, switched out the lure, and cast it back out. Plunk. The days following Cheryl's death were the darkest of his life. The bar he kept moderately stocked, pre-zombies, depleted quickly. Every waking minute he spent with a bottle in hand or nearby, the other hand stayed close to his 9mm. His days blurred into a drunken delirium of alternating stares between the bottom of the bottle and the barrel of a gun. Jim had been naive to think they would ride out the end of the world together at home. Now he was alone and there was nothing left for him to live for. The last day at the house started like the rest of the post-Cheryl days. He woke up to a relentless hangover. Empty liquor bottles were scattered around the house. His gun lay on the coffee table by the couch, always within reach. As he frequently did, he picked it up and held it in front of him, the barrel aimed at his face. What am I waiting for? He contemplated the question as if he didn't know the answer, but it was the same every time he put the gun in his mouth or to his temple. He was afraid. The house was a tomb, 
and it was a matter of time before he succumbed to one form of self-annihilation or another. Either he would blow his brains out, or he would drink himself to death. There was no reason to stay, and yet there was nowhere to go. That was when the light bulb went off in his head. There was, in fact, somewhere to go. The same place he always wanted to go. The lake. Almost instantly, the plan fell into place in his mind. It was absurd, yet perfect. The simplicity of it sent him into a fit of laughter, aggravating his already severe headache. For the first time in days, he had a purpose. The final act of his story. He loaded down the boat with all the bottled water and canned food he could fit, hooked the trailer to his truck, and pulled away for the last time. He glanced back at the house as he coasted down the driveway. In his mind, Cheryl stood on the porch, waving at him. Three hours later, the boat was in the water. The trip normally took only an hour, but several detours to avoid abandoned cars on the road slowed him down. The drive was scenic, and he was spared too many encounters with the dead. Mostly, they wandered in the fields and turned to watch him pass. In his rear view, he saw them change course and follow the fading sound of the motor. That sound turned out to be a beacon. The scattered few zombies around the lake turned into an army over the course of the three days he'd been on the water. Jim's pole twitched, and he mechanically set the hook and reeled in a small bluegill. He removed the hook with a steady hand, then held the fish up in front of his face. He looked into the small eyes of the creature. Living eyes. It was a comfort to share a space, if only for a moment, with another living creature. He sighed and dropped the fish back into the lake. The zombies on the bank moaned and shuffled around, excited by Jim's heightened activity. He watched them with contempt. He felt like an animal in a zoo being gawked at by a horde of onlookers. The more proper analogy was the dead were vultures, waiting for a wounded animal to die. Waiting to feed. Curiously, the dead did not seem to like the water. Once, on the first day, one of them had walked into the lake towards him. It disappeared into the water and never resurfaced. Jim hypothesized that the thing's lungs had filled with water causing it to sink, and it probably dropped into a deep area of the lake and couldn't get out. He found it disturbing to think about the dead man pacing around the bottom of the lake in darkness for who knew how long. Eternity? Another scenario occasionally played through his mind where the dead would walk into the water, one by one, filling the lake with corpses on top of corpses until his boat floated atop the dead, and the last wave would walk on a dead sea and take him. It was an outlandish thought, but then again, the world had become an outlandish place. Jim knew this wouldn't last forever. Eventually, he would run out of supplies. Eventually, he would run out of hope. Eventually, he would use the gun one last time. For now, though, he was fishing. Plunk. I'd like to thank y'all for stopping by this evening. We always enjoy the company and hope to see y'all again real soon. Until then, remember that horror ain't about us living in darkness. It's about darkness living in us. So, uh, try to stay close to the porch light. <laughs>